Canada, of course, was designed as a federation. The national government would be responsible for some things, the provincial governments, others. And the pendulum of who does what has swung mightily over the years. Some people now joke that the federal government has become so removed from people's lives, all it does is go to war and deliver the mail, and that's about it. Well, let's add a couple of voices to our discussion, and with that, we welcome Richard Gwynn, whose two-volume biography on our first prime minister truly is the gold standard on Sir John A.'s life. And Sylvia Bashevkin, professor of political science at the University of Toronto, whose most recent book is Women, Power, Politics, the Hidden Story of Canada's Unfinished Democracy. And of course, we welcome back John Boyko, author of Sir John's Echo, and he returns to our table as well. Uh, good to have you two here. Been a long Thank time. Nice to have you all back. John Boyko tells us that Canada is an ongoing conversation. So I want to find out off the top here, Sylvia, to you first, where are we in this conversation in terms of whether the national voice, Sir John's echo, mm -hmm. is predominant or whether the patriotic but lesser fiefdoms of the provincial premiers are in ascension? What do you think? Well, I think we're currently in a pattern where those two competing concepts are, um, are duking it out. Right, so I would argue that we still have uh, very strong voices uh, for the importance of provinces, uh, for the importance of provincial level innovation that leads to federal uh, programs of the types uh, that John talked about. And we also have arguments for the importance of national standards. Right? So it seems to me that we're in a period where our prime minister, for example, seems to have some, some willingness to, uh, uh, to admit the strengths of both sides. Admit the strengths of both sides. Yes, as opposed to be entirely putting his uh, stock in one or the other. Richard Gwynne, how strong is Sir John A's echo today? Well, what's more important than, John, than Sir John A's echo is that Canada's echo is so powerful. Mm. You're looking at, we're talking about, I hate to say this because you're not supposed to say this, what is obviously beyond any argument the most successful country in the world. Now, you can't discuss Canada unless you start from that premise. There is no doubt, nobody would argue it, only Canadians would argue about it, that this country is the most successful in the world. Defined how? We are the country that most of the world thinks is the most successful. When there was a big survey of the whole world, countries of all kind, kind some rich, some poor, blah, 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 they said, and they asked people, some 40,000 people, if you had the choice, which country would you go to? It wasn't the Canadian came first. Of course we came first. We were more people in the world on their representatives wanted to come to Canada than all the rest of the world wanted to go to any other country. Now, this country, this is simply a very important fact. It's very hard to say because you sound like doing the thing that Canadians should never do, say we're the best. I'm not saying we're the best, but we're very high up. Only the wretched Scandinavians do better than us. <laughs> we can never beat them. They will always be ahead of us. There's no point in even whining about that. But that's the whole point. We, we, it, we work. So don't get quite... We get, it's, it's, it's unnecessary to worry too much about how many people are federalists and how many people are nationalists and how much people are regional and so on. Well, let's ask the follow-up then, which is, do we work so well and are we such a desirable country to be in around the world because of the path Sir John A. put us on 150 years ago? That's a good question. He, he was very important. I would though say that the real turning point was during after the Second World War. And Canadians did something that was quite extraordinary. We adopted the welfare state. And the welfare state changes everything because everybody gets to go to medicine if they need it. You know, all, they get his pension, they get all kinds of things. That is what being a Canadian is. That is when we became a nation, a real nation. Before that, we were little bits and pieces of things. That's when we started, and it was right after the Second World War. And, uh, and our performance after the Second World War was transformational compared to the First World War, when we had terrible losses, 65,000 dead, and did nothing for them, nothing. For all those people who survived, you know, crippled, we did nothing for them. In, 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 but in, from 1865 on, we, 1965, I'm so sorry, <coughs> we did everything we could. And we transformed this country. How much of the credit for Canada being as successful as it is today do you want to give to Sir John A. and the fact that we have heard his echo over the last 150 years? I think we 
should give a great deal of credit to the structure that was put in place that enabled everything that Richard was just talking about to, to happen. Um, one of the things that Sir John recognized uh, when looking at the negative example of the United States is that if we are going to be a united country, then we need the federal government to be the voice for the country. We need the federal government to have the power and capacity to build the country and to respond to emergencies. And it is that power and capacity married with leadership because having the structural power means nothing if you don't have the leader that is going to properly use it. Um, those are the things that put us on the road to being the type of country that Richard was just saying. And, and I, I agree, I think Canada and Canadians deserve to be more proud of the country they have. We, we still seem to think that we're a young country, and we're not. Yeah. We're one of the oldest democracies in the world. Yeah. Even the, the democracies that we look at with respect to Germany, Russia have been around since the, the 1990s, mm -hmm. if we can call sure. Russia democracy still. And Britain is in the middle of reinventing mm -hmm. itself, as I think the United States are. So we are one of the oldest, and we're one of the most stable, and we're one of the richest. And we have that. To thank for that, I believe, is the structure that Sir John and the other founders put in place. But if I might uh, go back to the point about provincial innovation, yes, it seems to me that our the ability of the federal government to roll out important innovations of the type that Richard's talking about, things like health care, mm -hmm. now child care, mm -hmm. that requires a certain level of subnational innovation because very few provincial um, leaders are. Uh, going to be able to get the cooperation of all their peers in order to do everything at once. Mm -hmm. uh, and no, no prime minister can force that uh, either. So the fact that we had healthcare innovation initially in Saskatchewan, that we had certain daycare innovations in Quebec and British Columbia, I think that's made an enormous difference in the ability of Canada to roll out the welfare state we have, which is arguably much more robust than that of the United States, mm -hmm. but considerably less robust than that of many systems in Northern Europe. So you can but hear that echo of Sir John's, even at the provincial level. You can hear it at the provincial level, but it seems to me we still have to give some credit uh, to his willingness to go for what we could call a quasi-federal bargain, right? Where mm -hmm. Canada starts out as something like a unitary state, but with provinces, right? And we've seen the genius of innovation as well, the Judicial um, a Committee of the Privy Council, those decisions that come down from London that mm -hmm. recognize you the need. just take 30 seconds and explain what sure. the JCPC sure. was the back JCPC. in the day. The JCPC, so let's Everybody come Everybody knows that. No, they yeah. don't. <laughs> not, not everybody's... Uh, we know, didn't all had, take Sylvia's had, class, had, so had, we yeah, don't so know. Yeah. 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 So uh, prior to the time that our Supreme Court became the sovereign arbiter of constitutional law in this country in the late 1940s, all of our constitutional uh, decision making, the final arbiter, was uh, in the hands of the Judicial uh, Council uh, Committee of the Privy Council in London, England. And so many important decisions, including the one that gave women the right to sit in the Canadian Senate, uh, went to the JCPC. That one went in the 1920s. And the point is that those judges who were sitting in London were very sensitive to the amount of geography in this country, the extent to which a French-English bargain had been struck at origin. Oh, look at him shake his head. He's not buying. He's not buying. No. But it seems to me that there is an interpretation which says that we needed a quasi-federal system. We couldn't have an entirely unitary state, mm. right? We needed some you know, resonance with the regions and with the language groups in this country. And it seems to me that that same level of um, flexibility and resilience is very crucial to our federal system. There have been other federations that we know are just for historians to study, one being Czechoslovakia, very short-lived federation, right, from the end of World War I through the Nazi invasion. So we want our mm. federations, Richard points out, to be more durable. Okay, but and I gotta find out why he's shaking his head so violently there a second ago. Well, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council was appalling. It, not one of its people had ever been to Canada for even one moment. None of them knew anything about Canada. None of them knew a damn about Canada. They recast our constitution by giving a great deal of extra power to provinces. But it wasn't... They, and nobody knows why they did it. Well, they I could think see they a map, it. Richard. They could see the size of the place compared well, to we, their we, island. We, we had maps. You know, Canadians didn't need the judicial committee. But they took this, I think, because they were bored. They didn't have much to do. They really weren't very important as far as Britain was concerned. But they were important for provincial powers. I know, for us, but these people, these judges, really didn't have much to do, and they had the chance. But when you go into somebody else's country and know nothing about it and will not accept any statement made by a Canadian, 
That is, for instance, if the prime minister or senior official or whatever it was had said, hey, this is what we were meant, intended to do. None of that was acceptable in their defense. However, to their defense, I mean, women uh, couldn't sit in the Canadian Senate if we'd only You're had Canadian right, decision but that makers. Was about they made some years. very insightful decisions. But, but with all due respect, Sylvia, you're quite right on that, and it's, it, it's to their credit. But it took them 50 years to do something worthwhile. The rest they just invented. As much as I'd love to spend the entire hour discussing the merits of the JCPC, I'm going to bring us back to present day. And I want to pluck this quote out of John Boyko's latest book here, Sir John's Echo. Uh, and let's take the issue of climate change here as it relates to this pendulum that has been swinging back and forth between who's got the power in the country. If you would, please, let's bring this quote up. Saskatchewan's Premier Brad Wall said, The level of disrespect shown by the Prime Minister and his government today is stunning. In fact, the only thing Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was disrespecting were provincial leaders who were refusing to join him on the right side of history. Trudeau was respecting us by harnessing the power of the federal government as it was meant to be used, so says John Boyko. We are a federation, and I just wonder why you don't have a bigger problem with the fact that the federal government has basically put forward an edict, because that's what it is, mm -hmm. saying... Either you provinces will get into line and, and do something on climate change, or we're going to do it for you. And this is an area of responsibility that is in provincial jurisdiction. Why does that not offend you at all? It doesn't offend me at all because climate change, two reasons. One, climate change is the issue of our time. Um, the, the future of everyone's grandchildren, even yet on board, is going to be determined by how the world looks and handles climate change. So. What would we think of the federal government in the 19, late 1930s when the Second World War began if we said, well, fighting Hitler is, is interesting, but we believe that we should allow the provinces to have more power to do that, and we are not going to gather no, 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 the but, power, but and we are... Does mm -hmm. that analogy work? I mean, because the military is clearly a federal responsibility. The right. defense of the realm is clearly federal. But in order that we could put an army into the field, the federal government took enormous more power in order to re-regulate and reconstitute the, the, the federation with respect to the economy and moving people from here to there. It was a fight that needed to be fought, and it was fought with the power of the federal government that Sir John had put in place. Now, the fight that needs to be fought is climate change. And so therefore, when um, Mr. Trudeau looked and saw what would happen if it were left to a number of provinces, not all, because some provinces were already making great strides, he made the determination that this is a time where we need to fight that fight with all the power that the federal government has. And he made a similar uh, stand with respect to health care. And he said, this is what will happen with health care. And if you want the money that, that is on the table, then you will need to buy into the two initiatives that the federal government believes are important, mental health and elder care. And he did the same thing with, with pensions. So what he is doing is what Sir John would have applauded and said, we believe that the federal government is the voice for Canada. This is what's good for all Canadians, given the challenges ahead, pensions, health care, climate change. And therefore, we are using the power of the federal government. Do your power to the provinces instincts get offended by the way that the prime minister of the country today has heard Sir John's echo on this issue of climate change? Well, I think my instincts are those which say, look, Canada is a very healthy federation because instead of having internal wars, we have this ongoing sort of psychoanalytic conversation in the country <laughs> about something that's, you know, Joe Clark's idea of the community of communities and uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau's critique of what he called shopping plaza mm -hmm. federalism, too much decentralization and the, the benefits of national standards. So it seems to me that we have a good ongoing tug of war. That's the nature, it seems to me, of a healthy democracy where we're prepared to say to the province as well, you know, we need to do something about health care. Look at Canada cities. Look at housing. Look how federal governments have consistently neglected housing and transportation in our major cities. Mm -hmm. We're one of the most urbanized countries in the world, and yet we have very little federal policy and very little in the way of municipal autonomy mm -hmm. uh, or in, you know, in our cities. So it seems to me that this... This jostling is very important, and it helps us to test out various solutions at the subnational level that can then be adopted more nationally. I mean, my, my instinct tells me that usually the federal government does win. It just requires skill and, you know, adroitness and deviousness, will. which, which of course, Donald was too. very good at, <laughs> deviousness. Yeah. But, you know, they usually, they usually get what... We, 
I think, John, because he's, he's so good as a historian, but I think you're exaggerating a bit the problem. There is a problem. There clearly is a problem. But by and large, a good prime minister can always win. Mm -hmm. And that, Quebec obviously is a special case. And so, by the way, are na na Native people. I mean, they, they also aren't moved by the great Canadian thing in the way that mm -hmm. other Canadians are. But most Canadians, I think, will go on the side of the central government if, they, if there's not any good reason not to. Well, John, you mentioned health care, and I want to follow up there. And again, I want to take us back 50 years. We're in the middle 1960s. Lester Pearson is the prime minister of the country, liberal politician. John Robarts is the premier of Ontario, conservative politician. Prime minister says we're going to have Medicare. We're going to have single-payer system across the country, full-throated health care system. I don't think anybody in the country... I shouldn't say that. I think most people in the country are happy with that decision and would not want to turn the clock back 50 years to what we had before that. Robarts issued a warning. Mm -hmm. Robarts said this is all well and good as long as the federal government's going to pay half the shot. Mm -hmm. But there will come a time when the federal government will want to withdraw its contribution from half and half, and then we're going to be stuck holding the bag. Mm -hmm. He was absolutely right about that. I wonder, the question for you is, in that case, did Sir John's echo overreach to the point where now today you're giving credit to Prime Minister Trudeau for the transfers he's giving to the provinces for health care dollars. And the fact is, by the time the current agreement expires, the federal government will be funding less of a share of the health care bill in this country than it did at the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's way too long a question. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think that what we have is, is what, what, what Sylvia mentioned is a conversation. And that one of the strengths of our country, as Richard said, is that we are diverse. And there are various opinions in the country on anything at any time. But we are unlike other countries that we don't reach for a gun, we reach for a gavel, we're going to have a meeting, we'll form a committee, and we will duke it out. And one of the things that you mentioned with respect to healthcare is that the funding model has changed. True. And that ne gets negotiated every generation. It will get re renegotiated again a few years from now. Well, I'm going to stop you there. It there was no negotiation when Stephen Harper was in. He essentially went to the table and put down, said, here's the final offer, take it or leave it. True. There's no negotiation. Mr. Harper has uh, had a way of um, doing such yeah. like, That okay. was his form of negotiation. Um, but um, that is, is where power and leadership come, come into play. Um, I believe that despite the fact that the amount of money that, directly to your question, that the federal government is putting into health care today does not negate the fact that Canadians still have health care. Mm -hmm. And if I have to pay this much taxes out of this pocket as opposed to that pocket, now I have going to pay a little bit less out of that, a little bit more out of that. If Canadians still have the health care that they deserve, then I think Canadians are happy. And that, that to and fro um, between the feds and the provinces will always happen. Does that mean that the federal government is somehow mistreating the provincial governments? Provinces would say yes. John, the problem with, with healthcare is there are too many guys like me hanging on. <laughs> that's the, ba that, that's <laughs> the basic the problem. System. We're but, kind of thankful about that, Richard. I, no, if you no, don't I know mind you are. I'm glad. Yeah. My wife is <laughs> figuring out. But, the, but the, the truth about healthcare is we have to pay for it. Yeah. It is going to get paid for. Mm. And everybody will scream and yell. Every province will scream and yell and say, Ottawa should give it more and all that. But it's going to be paid for. There's mm. no way you can back out from that. I think there's an element here of social policy that we, we are ignoring, and that is the fact that health care was in a bundle with education and social assistance at mm -hmm. one time. Mm -hmm. And we saw, beginning in the Mulroney years, some very significant cuts that mm -hmm. affected the federal role in social housing in cities, and that affected, in particular, social assistance. And we've seen a further winnowing away. So in a middle-class world where people talk about health care and how much should... Uh, uh, you know, we as citizens pay and how much, uh, you know, should be private and public and so on, we're really neglecting the fact that our welfare state has become increasingly, um, shall we say, residual or marginal um, in terms of its willingness to offer what used to be a far more robust redistributive side on the social assistance piece. We're forgetting that. And it seems to me health care is, is, a, is a major debate and it affects all Canadians. Um, and the debate about who's going to stand up for people who are far less uh, advantaged 
kind of has fallen off the table, it seems to me, since the early 1990s. Okay, I, I hear you, but the point I guess I'm trying to make through the question is, John Boyko wants us to hear Sir John A's echo mm -hmm. these days mm -hmm. and, and have a strong national government that can speak for all Canadians. And I guess the example of Medicare is one that suggests, great, the federal government wants to get out there and be the big man on campus and create these fabulous new programs and then abdicate its responsibilities to appropriately fund them, leaving the provinces to carry the bag. How fair is that? How, how much praise do you want to get because of that? That's my question. There, and there certainly are some huge questions about the extent to which the federal government innovates in some fields and gets a huge pushback. Mm. Uh, Richard didn't mention the National Energy Program. Mm. He says, you know, the feds generally get their way. Well, actually, the Liberal Party has been locked out of Alberta for a darn long time, sure. right? Yeah. Uh, as a result of those consequences. Alberta's changing its mind on a number of matters. Well, it may be. <laughs> but the point is the federal government doesn't always get its way and doesn't always have ideas in no. mind which are regionally sensitive, shall we say. Um, and so it, it seems to me in talking about social policy and equating it with health care, we're neglecting a large piece of what Sir John A., I think, would have seen as the historical kind of um, funding role towards a welfare state, which obviously didn't exist in the late 19th century, mm -hmm. but has existed since the end of World War II, and the Fed's role in that, and also mm -hmm. the fact that so much has been devolved. The point, the point is we're living in an age where the sort of downloading to provinces and municipalities has been very, very extreme since mm -hmm. the Maroon years. And we're forgetting about where things really wear thin. And it's, I would argue, uh, highly, highly related to socioeconomic status. All right, let me, let, let's try a different angle here on this then. Would you agree that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? As a general statement. I've never had any experience. This is <laughs> I would have no idea. Yeah. Um, well, okay, humor me for a second here, because <laughs> as you argue for a stronger central government that yes. is able to speak with one vision for Canada, I wonder whether investing too much power in that senior level of government runs the risk of abuse. I believe that having dominant power in the federal government is not the same as having dictatorial power in the federal government. And I believe that there are enough checks and balances in the Canadian system that that would, would never happen. Part of the checks and balances are the premiers that always fight back. And it is their job to fight back, and they do so well. And our history shows many premiers uh, who have fought back gallantly. Um, Lougheed during the, uh, the oil crisis of the 1970s, for example, Mowat, even earlier fighting back directly against Sir John. So no, I don't think that dictatorial power um, is something that we need to either contemplate or worry about. Richard, how about you on that? Do you worry that if the federal government becomes too powerful, it's ripe for abuse? No, I mean, I, I, I trust the federal government. And this is so corny to say, but I trust Canadians. Canadians generally do the right thing. Their record is pretty damn good. I hate to say that, but it is true. That's twice I mean, you've said I hate the, to say that. Well, no, <laughs> well, I mean, because I'm speaking the truth, so I don't want to make, <laughs> keep on doing it. <laughs> but, you know, we are a very successful country, and we should just assume that we will sort out these problems. There is no magic to any of them, but normally a prime minister can get his way enough mm. time, his or her way, by the so far, of course, there's only one her. But, uh, and so we're, we're frothing about trying to expect the perfect. We're not going to get the perfect, except for the goddamn <laughs> Scandinavians. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's, say, sorry, Sylvia, go ahead. I would say that uh, we also need to, uh, to bear in mind that, you know, the, the old power that uh, leaders had in the age of Sir John A., the executive federalism model mm -hmm. where all those guys, and they were all guys, could go to Prince Edward Island mm -hmm. or wherever and, and make their deals, that we saw uh, fell apart by the period of Meech Lake mm -hmm. and Charlottetown, right? We have a huge decline sure. of deference. We have an increasingly educated population. Yeah. We had key players in those debates in the Mulroney years who were not provincial leaders, right? Mm -hmm. They were people like Elijah Harper, there were people like Judy Rebick at the time, president of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women. People who said, look, these deals have been made by, you know, a bunch of white guys in a room and they don't represent what Canadians want. So we have, in addition to the checks and balances of provinces, we have a civil society that it seems to me has been quite engaged in keeping more checks on leaders. And some leaders, of course, deplore that because they see it as leading to the ungovernability of the Federation. Yeah. Others of us think it's part of a healthy civil society. We also have, if I could interrupt, the civil society in Canada that admires complexity and, except for a small percentage, I think, um, admire the fact that we never villainize the other. 
And I mm -hmm. think what has been happening in Britain with respect to Brexit and what's been happening in the United States with the rise of Donald Trump is less likely to happen in Canada because of that civil society that, that you've just described. And that is an essential part of what keeps the federal government from gaining too much power or exerting power in an irresponsible manner. I want to make a, uh, an ironic observation here, <laughs> if I can. And Richard, I'll get you to comment on sure. it first. Uh, Sir Johnny MacDonald, whom you chronicle so well in your two books, was, of course, a conservative. Mm. The, the prime ministers who have most heard Sir John A.'s echo uh, are both last names Trudeau. Sure. Pierre and Justin. Sure, absolutely. They're liberals. The prime ministers who have really not followed Sir John A.'s echo, in the sense of the way we're talking about it here tonight, are guys like Mulroney and Harper and Clark, and they're conservatives. What are we to make of that? Well, I mean, yes, but, you know, if we go to Mulroney, you know, who, who's had a hard time, and he deserved it on certain things. But he performed very important work in terms of South Africa and breaking that system. Oh. And, he, and he, he argued with, you know, very powerful people. And that was a real achievement by Canada. But he also argued for a decentralized, uh, a, an increasing decentralization, which we talked about in the first segment, that, that was not consistent yes, with Sir John Lee's he was trying to deal with a particular issue, and I don't know why I'm defending <laughs> Mulroney, because I'm not usually <laughs> hastily there. But he, was, he wanted to settle the deal with, with Quebec. Yes. Uh, and, of course, Trudeau was much more combative. Uh, and it worked out. Trudeau worked out. We're very lucky. Uh, but... Uh, he, 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 and, but Canadians were worried it was going to be too, Quebec was going to be too powerful. Hmm. And that was really the mood among Quebecers. So, Canadians. So, do you find anything ironic in the fact that the Liberal Prime Ministers that have followed Sir John A. seem to be more in tune with his echo? I've always found that to be ironic in teaching Canadian federalism, but I also find that there is the spillover from the United States, which is, again, quite ironic given Sir John A.'s history, right? The spillover of states' rights thinking from American conservatism into Canada. And we have this sense that provincial rights are often very firmly defended by, by conservatives uh, in this country. Um, and that that decentralist impulse to talk about the individual and not the collective in Canada is seen as, you know, a, a sort of potentially collectivist and interventionist federal government. And the conservatives push back against that. At the same time, as Richard points out, uh, you know, Brian Mulroney, if you read Margaret Thatcher's memoirs, he's condemned as too progressive mm -hmm. and not sufficiently conservative, mm -hmm. right? That's yeah. what, because she tangled with him on South Africa and mm -hmm. other things. Right. Mulroney also brought more women into the federal cabinet than had ever been the case in Canadian history. And the greenest prime minister of the last half century. So mm -hmm. there, there were things about Mulroney that did not make him an American conservative. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not suggesting that. But there is this decentralist impulse that we see. Uh, we only have to watch Donald Trump, for example, talk about the state's rights to, to, to decide all kinds of things. And so we can see that that North American small c conservatism has spilled over here, um, and that there are more capital L liberals who seem to be more interested in um, a central government. We certainly saw that when Clyde Wells, as Newfoundland Premier, took on Brian Mulroney. I would argue Clyde Wells was one of the most articulate defenders of a centralist view of confederation. And Mulroney hates him to this day. Well, you know what? That's a personal thing. We're no. here to talk about the ideas. Indeed. And it okay. seems to me that yeah. he's another liberal that fits that mold. Right on. we got a couple of minutes to go here, and I want to put one more quote from the book on the table here, and John, I'll get you to speak to it. Mm -hmm. Our voice is that of the federal government. When it speaks for us and for Canada, it's always with a hint of a soft Scottish burr. For it is, after all, Sir John's echo. That's a lovely quote from the book. Mm -hmm. I do wonder, though, how comfortable you are concluding that, given that there have been broad swaths of time in the history of this country, some in our lifetimes very recently, where the federal liberal government has been persona non grata in much of Western Canada, where the conservative government has been persona non grata in much of Quebec. Mm -hmm. you, you say the federal government needs the power to speak for the whole country, and yet the federal government, I don't think it's too strong in saying this, has felt like a bit of an enemy occupier in much of this country. How do we get our heads around all that? I think we need a broader perspective, and this comes back to the question you asked before, and the broader perspective would say that it is all about perspective and it's not about party. Um, the federal politicians who have been most 
um, vehement in their defense of Sir John's vision for the country um, have been liberals. And I would add uh, Mackenzie King to the, to the pot and say that he was there too, and, and Laurier to a certain degree. So it is less about party and more about perspective. Um, one of the uh, people who, uh, Premier, who defended uh, Trudeau, for example, was Bill Davis, who you know a great deal about, and he was a conservative. So that's one point. The Pro second progressive conservative. Progressive say, conservative. Yes. The second point is that saying that uh, Alberta uh, will not elect a liberal and therefore that the liberal government uh, doesn't speak for it, I think forgets the point that the, they have just elected an NDP government. And if we look back a little farther, um, there were years when Prime Minister Bennett and before that um, the MP um, R.B. Bennett was the only conservative elected mm -hmm. in Alberta because um, at one point uh, it was said that the only thing that protected conservatives in Alberta were the game laws. So <laughs> it will shift and it will shift <laughs> that, back. That pendulum does swing. Uh, I want to thank you for making the trip in from Lakefield, Ontario thank to you. join us once again here at TVO. Sylvia Bashevkin and Richard Gwynn, always great to have you at our table as well. Thank Thanks so much you. everybody for this uh, scintillating discussion about Sir <laughs> John's you. echo, which I can hear coming around the corner now with that <laughs> Scottish burr indeed. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.